Welcome to the Trevor Roberts Talk Fest podcast. Tonight we're going to talk about a book called The Third Door by Alex Benayan. I'm obsessed with this book. I've already read it, I'd say, one and a half times. I'm going back through it a third time right now. Um, the second time I sort of skipped it. This time I'm going back through it, making notes, highlighting. Um, recently, I follow a guy named Vin. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. I think it's Yang. Um, it's spelled G-I-A-N-G-H, I think. And he says that you should read the book. Then you should discuss the book. Then you should write an action that you're going to take based on each chapter. And then there's actually further steps that I'm not ready to do yet. But um, so um, I have discussed the book with a friend. I've read it twice. And now I'm starting to take action on the chapters I'm reading. But there's other books I want to go through. It's just that this book was given to me actually by my work. And I really wasn't expecting much. It was just, you know, something that work was giving out. It was passed down to me, kind of came in the mail. The copy I originally had was signed. I actually gave that copy to a friend. And when I read it, it just totally blew me away. And it really gave me life back in the search of trying to do something more, try to start my own thing, try to be creative, try to create content. And that journey and the process. I mean, over the years, I've wanted to do it. And it's just a very difficult thing to find the time to do to have the ideas to do it. How do you want to do it? And it just gave me the courage to start back up and try again. So it's something that I've, I've really latched on to but now I'm excited to talk about why. One thing I absolutely love about the book is he tells the entire book in the format of stories. So basically everything is like a hundred little mini stories that he went on. And it's sort of the dream of a young college aged person who's not sure what they want to do with their life. And they choose to go down this adventurous path. I mean, anybody would love to just, I don't know if anybody, but for me personally, it was like, you're in college, you don't really know why, you don't really know, you know why you're there, but you don't know exactly what you want to do. Anybody that's changed their major a few times, maybe they showed up for classes on day one because they knew college was the thing you did after high school, but they didn't know what they wanted to, what their degree was, what they wanted to do after college, or maybe there was a certain expectation given to them. And so they went into that, but that wasn't really what they wanted to do but they didn't know what they wanted to do instead. And then they choose to go on a crazy adventure instead. Um, so I just kind of, what I want to do is talk through the book. Now, I think that there might be like 26 to 30 chapters, but he's got the book broken up into five steps. So today we're going to talk about step one. It's actually only three chapters. I want to talk a little bit about uh, a little bit more about the book, just kind of share my overview of it. I think we'll kind of do that as we're going through it. I think where I want to start is talking about the acclaim. So this is going to be um, all the people that have read the book and just kind of given it their two cents or their acclaim, if you will, and just saying basically it's an awesome book. I don't, I'm not going to go through all of them, but there is a ton pages and pages and pages, you know, normally on the back of the book, yeah, like you'll see the back of the book has like four or five of them. And you might see that on every, in any book where it says, hey, you know, four or five people are saying this is a good book. This is just pages and pages of people all saying how much they love the book. And I want to read who these people are and the jobs that they have. Now, again, I'm not going to do all of them. I'm just going to touch on a couple of them. So, Sean Acor, New York Times bestselling author, Maya Watson Banks, director of marketing at Netflix, Mike Posner, Grammy Award nominated and multi-platinum musician. I'm skipping a bunch here. Susie Levine, United States ambassador to Switzerland, 
and Lichtenstein. Uh, Brad Delson, lead guitarist. I love this one. Lead guitarist of the Grammy Award winning rock band Linkin Park. Linkin Park was my very first concert. Karen Cater, former director of the Office of Educational Technology in the U.S. Department of Education. Let's just see what this person says. Alex Benign was intent on creating his dreamy university. Bill Gates would teach business, Lady Gaga music, Steven Spielberg film. Jane Goodall Science, and that vision became a reality. This book proves that education is one of the most powerful forces in the world, and it's made even more powerful when you take charge of your own learning. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Michael Slabby, Chief Innovation Officer of the Obama 2012 Presidential Campaign and Executive Director of Chicago Ideas. What a cool person to just give your book props. Um... Director of West Coast Brand Experience at Nike's in here. Uh, Grammy Award winning rapper. Matthew Bishop, author of Philanthro Capitalism and former business director of The Economist, which is a pretty sweet um, magazine that my buddy used to read all the time. I think that's enough, but I skipped a ton. Like, there's just, and all these people are just so successful, like owners of newspapers. Owner, like people that worked on presidential campaigns, people that are part of the government, uh, people high up in universities. And it's just like, it's wild. And you can go on YouTube and just, just Google the third door, Alex Benayan. The book's little message here is the wild quest to uncover how the world's most successful people launch their careers. So we'll talk about it more as we go through the book. But essentially, he he doesn't know what he wants to do. And so he he starts thinking about people that were really successful. And the first one that comes to his mind is Bill Gates. And he thinks about Microsoft. And then he actually talks about how he sort of retired from Microsoft, even though he didn't really. And he started creating other businesses and he was working on those. And it's like, okay, we know that he created some of the most successful businesses that there are. And he became the richest person in the world. But how did he get started? Where did he come from? What was? How did he get made before anyone knew who he was? And he couldn't really figure that out. Um, he kind of starts thinking about Steven Spielberg, and it's like, well, how did Steven Spielberg get his start? And then he gets this idea in his head where it's basically like, if you don't know what you, if even if you kind of figure out what you want to do, but you don't know what the first step is, how do you get started? And then he's like, I want to interview these people and ask them and he can't really find um, another he doesn't think of another good way to do it right so he can't find a book that has these type of interviews so he decides he wants to do the interviews and so he sort of makes a list of all the people he wants to interview and then he goes out on this mission to interview you know sort of the top person or just somebody he considers to be at the top of each different industry and he writes them all out and he says i want to interview these people and then the book is about a hundred little stories along the way of him going through and actually conducting these interviews and he doesn't have any connections like he is essentially in the beginning a nobody who's in college and he's 18 19 years old i mean he's a freshman and he doesn't, like, again, he doesn't have a connection to get him started at all. And he just decides, I want to interview Bill Gates. I want to interview Steven Spielberg, Lady Gaga. So how's he going to do that? And so the book is telling you about his journey to go through that. All right. So um, I want to read just one more thing. It's the first little page. Um, here, it's not even chapter one. It's just sort of this little message that you get right before you start the book. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm just going to read this through and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Life business success. It's just like a nightclub. There are always three ways in. There's the first door, the main entrance, where the line curves around the block, where 99% of people wait around hoping to get in. There's the second door, the VIP entrance, where the, where the billionaires, celebrities, and the people born into it just slip through. But no one tells you that there's always, always 
the third door. It's the entrance where you have to jump out of line, run down the alley, bang on the door a hundred times, crack open the window, sneak through the kitchen. There's always a way. Whether it's how Bill Gates sold his first piece of software or how Steven Spielberg became the youngest studio director in Hollywood history, they all took the third door. So I remember reading that for the very first time, and it really just stuck out to me that um, I didn't, I have always wanted to do something. I don't know what it is. I'm still searching for that. Um, but it's hard when you don't have, when you don't have door number two at your disposal, where you're the VIP or you're the celebrity and you're just given access, then there's the door number one, which is just what everyone else takes. And you can, you can do that. And of course we've all done that. You just wait in line and it's like, um, but you're not going to get through that many doors doing that. And then there's the person that is willing to do whatever it takes to find the third door. And then there's been times in life where I have been willing to do that. And it's always an adventure and it doesn't always work out. Sometimes it does. Sometimes you get something really cool. That's unexpected. But that journey is what I live for. There hasn't, it hasn't always been a time in my life where I could go through that journey. But there have been times where I have. And it's just like, that's really what I look back on life and where the fun memories are or something that's made a big impact on you. And again, sometimes you, you want your life to be a little bit more stable, like being a husband, being a father, raising two daughters, just sometimes routine is actually a good thing and having routine and having discipline and knowing what the next right step is and doing the next right thing. I absolutely believe in all of that. But there are times in life where you have to have courage, do something you're afraid to do, step out of your comfort zone, ask somebody for an introduction Hey, can you do this for me? Can you introduce me to so-and-so? Would you be willing to do this? Ask somebody something that you don't really want to ask. And if they say no, you don't want them to feel bad for even saying no. But sometimes in life to get to the third door, you have to do some uncomfortable things. And I have, at, again, I've at times been willing to do it. I want to challenge myself to do that a little bit more. All right, so... Uh, let's talk about chapter one. So he calls it staring at the ceiling. All right. So what I want to do, we'll just, we'll talk through the first three chapters. This is step one. He calls it ditch the line. And then we'll go through chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. I want to talk a little bit about what the chapter is, um, kind of provide some background. I'm not going to go through every single line. I've highlighted a few things I want to talk through. And then we'll talk through some of the messaging that I got out of it. So in chapter one, he's talking about staring at the ceiling. If you can picture, he's in his dorm room in college. Um, again, he doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. He's trying to ask himself what he's interested in. And he's thinking about his parents running through the Tehran airport, fleeing to America as refugees taking out a, <clears throat> sorry, let me, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, sacrificing everything to get him an education in America. So he doesn't provide a ton of background on this, but what we can take from this is that I don't, I didn't actually catch in the book, I don't think, and I haven't done any research on it, but I didn't catch if he was born in Tehran or if he was born here. His parents definitely born in Tehran. And they are fleeing to America. And the reason they're doing that is to give him a better education. So I kind of think he was born there. And they made a decision that they felt like raising him in America would give him a better chance at a education and brighter future. So I'm going to go with that. And they come to America. Now think about the sacrifice. Maybe they're thinking that uh, that's what they wanted, and they got something really positive out of it. But they're also probably losing like 
extended family, everything that they're used to, all of their memories, truly their home. I mean, I just moved from Nebraska to Washington. I'm loving it here in Washington. It's amazing. It's beautiful. The people are great. It's moody. I love it out here. But Nebraska is where I lived for 36 years. I mean, that's always going to be home. It, it feels very the heartland, the center of the country, um, good quality values, where I was born, farming. You know, my parents are farmer. My dad's a farmer. My mom's a nurse. And it's just very much like something is left behind. Something is lingering in Nebraska. And I think it always will be. So for his parents, they really sacrificed a lot to give him this education. I can totally understand that uh, being a father. But at the same time, as the child, you're thinking about that all the time. Like, oh, my parents, they sacrificed everything for me, so I better be a really good student. Um, he gets accepted into USC, and his mom starts crying because she's telling him we cannot afford it. And then his dad says, but they end up taking out a second mortgage on their house to pay the tuition. The dad wants to do anything, whatever it takes to get him this education. Okay, so he's really feeling the burden to go to school. And what they always wanted for him was to become a doctor. So he's pre-med. He's supposed to go and be a doctor. He's got like all of his science books and he hates it. And he's staring at the ceiling and he's just kind of thinking about this dilemma of like, I don't really want to be a doctor, but my parents sacrificed everything and left their, their country to come here. What do I do? And um, he's just thinking, thinking, thinking. And then he's like, okay, what would I do if I didn't want to become a doctor? And he has no idea. He just knows that he doesn't want to be a doctor, but he can't really figure out what he wants to do with his life. And I think that that's a theme that we can all relate to. I can think back. I changed my major multiple times. I did, can't remember exactly, but two years, I want to say, of psychology. And then maybe three. It was maybe three because I know I took some third year classes. But then I switched and did a full year. I want to say it was two and a half years, maybe. I think it was two and a half years. And then I did a half semester of event planning, oddly enough. It was like planning a concert, planning a giant conference, um, you know, like working on someone's tour or something like that, like working for a giant arena in your town and planning like sporting events and concerts and uh, philanthropies, like anything that might come through at that event center or whatever. It could be wedding planning, but it was event planning. I know I did that for at least a semester. And at the time, I was bartending at a bar, and I thought, maybe I'll own a bar, do some events at it. I don't know. I was 20 years old. But then I decided I wanted to switch to business. And I didn't even really want to do that. It's just that someone in my life who I looked up to, he had a business major. And he gave me some advice and said, if you get a business degree, you'll for sure be able to get a job. Now... I don't know that that's the advice I would pass along to somebody now that I've kind of went through with it. Like I ended up getting that business degree and I've had jobs in the business world. And now that I've done that, I probably would give a little, I would twist that advice to something else that I'm not going to talk about right now. But <clears throat> thankfully, I think for me personally, event planning probably wasn't it. Psychology could have been really cool, uh, but for, for reasons that maybe we'll discuss at another time, didn't go down that route. But I just, the point is, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And even when I ended up doing business, that wasn't for sure what I wanted to do. I just never really knew what I wanted to do. Still today, if I could do anything in the world, I don't know what that would be. I mean, really, if I could do anything, I don't know what it would be. I'd have to think on it. And I'd probably change my mind a few times. And so I can so relate to him not knowing what he wants to do, knowing, and it's it's wild to me because he's clearly very smart, gets into USC's pre-med. I mean, just thinking about maybe he doesn't want to do that forever, but like 
obviously he's if you think about if you play that out he graduates with the pre-med degree goes on and becomes a doctor maybe doesn't like every single day going to work but when he's not at work he's making a great income probably can live where he wants probably can travel money doesn't buy happiness but it can certainly set you up really nice take care of a, a lot of stressors in life can give you the freedom to be able to put things in your life that, of your own choosing and then you can be happy in that way and essentially not every single person like we all have to work and we're not always happy doing the day-to-day -day grind of whatever we do for a living. I mean, if you're a nurse, if you work at a bank, if you work where in the professional world, if you own a daycare, like whatever you might be doing, you're there's probably days where you didn't you don't want to do that. I mean, there's very few people that truly wake up and live their passion and their hobby and that's what they call work every single day. And so being a doctor is it's not like the worst thing in the world and he definitely doesn't want to do it. So it's it's really interesting to me that um he could have been a doctor and and doesn't want to. All right, so that was a little bit of a digression there, but anyway, he starts thinking about Bill Gates and Microsoft, all of his successes, but he wonders how he got started. Um he still doesn't know what he wants to do but he realizes he can't find any answers on the stage he's at. So basically, how did Bill Gates get started? And he realizes he wants to interview Bill Gates and ask him how he got started. And he starts thinking about other people he might want to interview. He doesn't really know for sure, but he's just thinking like the top people in different industries. Um, so he, he actually decides he wants to do this. He decides he wants to interview successful people and then write a book about this since there is no book that he can find. Um, but the problem is he needs money to set up to travel, conduct these interviews. He's like 19 years old. He doesn't have any money. So how's he going to get the money? And it's the craziest thing. He Okay, so he goes to school at USC, lives in Los Angeles. Uh, the Price is Right is filmed there. And for whatever reason, he realizes the Price is Right is like being filmed the next day. And somehow it clicks to him that the winner of The Price is Right gets all this money. And in, as I'm reading this in the book, I'm like, yeah, but this is stupid. Like, no, you don't get to just, it's, a, it's all like the odds of winning The Price is Right have to be crazy. You don't even, how do you even get on the show? And there's no, like, it's just it's just wild to me that he would even think that this is realistic. And he had a test for school for his pre-med doctor degree the next day. But instead of studying for the test, he decides to hack the prices right. And he and he's like basically reading up on how to get on the prices right. So that's the end of chapter one. Now, I talked about at the beginning of this that I wanted to take an action after reading every chapter. Um, the action, now, Vin, um, who I'm, I'm listening to right now, and he's helping me with communication skills, he says, don't overcomplicate it. Just, you want to take an action. So take time. The action I want to take is take time to reflect where I'm going in life and ask if that is where I want to be headed. So... Uh, that's something I want to do over this next week is just take a little time to think about where I'm headed personally, professionally, um, my values, where the family's headed, and just see if everything aligns if where I want it to be going. Just really take time to think about that. Okay, chapter two is The Price is Right. All right, so... This chapter's wild. I'm not going to tell the story of The Price is Right. I'm going to talk more about some of the takeaways from the chapter. Highly encourage you to read the book, though. He talks about his, his experience with The Price is Right here. Um, so he studies how to get on The Price is Right. So there's a, basically he learns that there's a producer that, interv that interviews audience members as they go inside the studio. And basically what the producer's doing is trying to find somebody as they're walking in that if their name were to be called, 
they would be entertaining for the show. And so the producers basically, they're like, how you doing? How you doing? Nice to meet you. Welcome. Welcome. You know, shaking hands with every single person that's going through the door. And then he learns there's sort of like a second assistant standing a little bit behind. And the producer leans back and says like the name and winks or something. And how do you get on that list? Well, you have to be very memorable, very entertaining, very loud, very busy with your hands, lots of energy. But you also, you also have to be likable by this producer. It's not like everybody can't, you don't just be loud and you get in, right? So he talks a little bit about exactly what he does there. Um, now, long story short, he does see the producer make a little note with his name. And so then he goes inside. So now he's feeling pretty confident that he's going to, like there's a chance his name will be called. And, um, and he'll be one of the contestants on The Price is Right. So then he realizes as he's waiting in line, to, he's still got to get in and go find his spot to sit down and all that. And as he's doing that, he realizes that he basically stayed up all night just figuring out how to do that, which mission accomplished, but he doesn't know how to play The Price is Right. He's never watched it before. He's not a big fan or anything. He just lived in LA and he knew it was filming tomorrow. So he doesn't know how to play. Like if he gets called, he doesn't know what to do or how to win or anything like that. And so he, he doesn't know what to do. And he just leans over to the person next to him and he just basically says, hey, so just in case I get called up there, I've never watched the show before and I have no idea how to play any advice. And the woman standing right next to him says she's been watching the show for 40 years. She's a mega fan. And, um, you know, stick with her and she'll tell him everything. And basically the message he gets from her is just always underbid. And she tells a story about how, um, you know, if you underbid by $10,000, you still have a shot. And if you overbid by $1, then you're out. So he learns the message loud and clear that no matter what, like underbid at all cost. And basically she says, eventually the other contestants will all overbid. You just need to be under. So he kind of kind of clicks for him like, oh, OK, so ask other people. So then he learns to another person and he leans over to someone else in the audience and then just says, basically the same story that he's never watched the show with any advice and everybody starts giving him advice like everybody has their own two cents about what you do and what to know and all the little tips and tricks and so his big takeaway there is just no matter what like no matter how prepared you are how much research you did how smart you might think you are or making an assumption about somebody like just be vulnerable and ask other people for their advice, which is really kind of crazy if you think about it. Like how many times in life do we just assume we know more than somebody um, with anything? Like you're watching a show and you think you know more about the show. Or if you're a parent, maybe you're parenting your child and you're with somebody else and they have their child and they're not doing something right or they're having a hard time getting their child potty trained. Like my wife and I are having a hard time with that. Um, anything, you know, like, and there, it could be anything where you just, you don't know a lot, but you don't want to ask, or maybe you consider yourself an expert um, and you don't want to learn and grow and be better. And so you don't ask, you know, and it's like his, he, in this moment, he did need some advice, but at the same time he had stayed up all night he had figured out how to for sure get on the show when a lot of those people probably didn't know. And he was just being vulnerable and saying, can you give me some advice? Um, and the last thing I, w I would say as you read the chapter is Drew Carey at the time is the one hosting the show. And he certainly does not paint a lovely picture of Drew Carey. So I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, but my biggest takeaway and the action that I want to take from this chapter is just that. Just be vulnerable and ask others for their advice. Uh, long story short, I will go ahead and spoil it, that he gets on, he does get picked. He does underbid and everybody else overbids and then he gets on. He doesn't do that great um, at first and he 
Um, I don't think he really does that great when it's his first little like him and he's playing a game or whatever. But it doesn't matter because if you get pulled on, I guess you go to the wheel and then it's you versus two other people and whoever spins the highest gets to go to the final round. That's all luck. There's not much you can do unless you like know how to spin the wheel. He just lucks out and wins that. So then he ends up head to head in the championship round with it's like the the huge deluxe thing where there's like the boat and the vacation package in the car or whatever and you have to bid for that whole package or whatever. And he goes up against like a super contestant. She's like, you know, I've been I'm amazing. Like she's watched the show her whole life. It almost makes it sound like she's been going to the show multiple times. And she's basically rude to him, like she's going to dominate him. And she doesn't overbid, but he just gets lucky and comes in uh, ahead of her. And so he ends up winning. So he gets, I mean, he literally wins the prices, right? And this isn't made up. This is like, he is a 19 year old kid that the night before decides to just research how to get on as a contestant. Then he ends up winning. Um, it's wild. And he taught any throughout the book, he's going to mention this several times. You learn a little bit more about the story, but he goes through every single thing, how it happens. Okay. So chapter three is the storage closet. So he, he won some prizes on the prices, right? He immediately sells it all. Um, so then he's just got this bank of money I think he ends up selling it gets like $16,000. But the value of the package, if I remember right, was like 31. But you know, I mean, he gets a boat like, you know, it's like a car. It's worth so much. But when you sell it, you get less and he doesn't care. He's just like, he just sells it. And he just wants the money because he's going to do this mission of interviewing people like crazy, successful people that he has no access to. So he sells all of his stuff and now he's got a this bank of money and he talks about how he buys Chipotle for all of his friends because none of them have any money. Um, but then he quickly is like, okay, puts a cap on that and is like going on his mission now. So now before we get back to the mission, he talks a little bit about some sacrifice he has to make. So uh picture he's at the end of of his freshman year and he's going into the summer and he gets an email from the school that basically says he's behind and if he doesn't take summer classes he's going to be behind on pre-med and won't be able to be pre-med at the school i don't know i guess they don't just let you do it at your own pace like you either stick with their schedule or you're out and he decides he doesn't want to be pre-med. So he's going to switch his business. He's going to switch his major to business. And he, again, he doesn't know what he wants to do. He doesn't know that business is right. He just knows that he doesn't want to be a doctor at the end of all this. And so he emails his mom and dad. Tells them he's switching majors from pre-med to business. Now... If I, when I told my mom and dad that I was switching from psychology to whatever, I really don't know what they thought. Um, I don't remember. I don't think it was life and death. I'm sure they, maybe they got a little spark of, well, is he going to, is he going to graduate? Is it like what's happening? But at the same time, I was the oldest child. I don't know what they expected. I don't know what they thought. <laughs> What he talks about when he emails his mom and dad that they're devastated. One of the mom is like crying. The dad won't talk to him. Even his grandma gets brought in. She's like devastated, pissed. They all think that his life is like ending. They talk about everything they sacrificed for him. So you just got to think like this is a big, big deal that he's not going to be a doctor. And he's still going to USC and going to get a business degree. <laughs> he's not dropping out. He's just not going to be a doctor. Um, so it's, but if you think about, you know, you had parents that fled from another country and sacrificed that much for you, it would be a big deal. So 
it just really stuck with me that even though I think it's silly, he is still sacrificing. And that was a hard email for him to send and it didn't work out well. Like he got some pretty negative feedback. So let's get back to the mission though. So now he's starting to focus in on his mission and he needs to figure out who to interview. So he gets his friends together. They all come to his dorm room. He tells us a little bit about his friends and their backgrounds. And there's a sports friend. There's a a friend that's kind of an introvert that likes to read. There's a friend that is into movies. There's like the social friend. Um, there, he talks about one of his friends. He calls them like the Olympic torch carrier because they sort of have the energy to just lead the charge for their friend group, which is really a cool, like he calls them the torch. Um, but anyway, he just talks about all of his friends and he tells them about the mission and he starts asking for people to interview. And so they come up with Bill Gates for business, Mark Zuckerberg for tech, Warren Buffett for finance, Tim Ferriss for sort of life. Tim, The one that reads is just reading, I think, the four-hour work week. And so he's like, definitely Tim Ferriss. Steven Spielberg for film, Lady Gaga for music, Larry King for broadcasting, and so on. I mean, the list goes on and on. And um, basically, I wrote down here... Dream big, write down your goals. The big action, though, for me that really sticks out is write down the mission. So it's not just like write down the goals. Like, yeah, he wrote down who he wanted to interview. But he turns it into a mission. Keeps calling it his mission. He's going to interview. It's not just like... You have to think about this a little bit. He... He, it's not, he's not just trying to interview someone successful for business and then turn in a paper for school. Like, hey, I've got to interview a successful person. Like, you know, for me, I work at a, like a finance type of a company. I could like email the CEO or I could email a director of something and say, hey, I'm writing a paper for school. Can I interview you? And then set it up like, He's trying to interview Bill Gates. And he's not just trying to interview Bill Gates. He's trying to pick somebody that's in the upper echelon of nearly every industry there is, interview them all, and then write a book about all the lessons he learned on how to how to get started with success. It's a very it's a very specific purposeful mission to learn how to get started for success by interviewing the upper echelon and across all industries. And it's, he's probably not going to interview every, like think about it from the beginning before he goes on the journey. He's probably not going to make it and interview every single person. Like Bill Gates might just say no, but he's hopefully going to interview a couple of them. And he is actually going to try to make this happen. And he's going on a journey for this. And it's about the mission. So he's writing down why he wants to do it, what he wants to do. And when I think about my own thing, I, I feel like, what do I want to do? Well, I'm, I'm wanting to podcast a little bit. Um, I like reading books and helping me better my skills. I like reading. I want to be a father. Uh, my wife and I want to create something that's independent that we can that we can kind of own and ha- and not have to rely on some outside sources where it's sort of we're creating our own business and i don't i feel like that needs to be honed in we need to come up with the mission we need to have a little bit more specific vision written down and um That was just my biggest takeaway from that is I've really gotten in the mindset right now of everything doesn't have to be perfect, but you need to get started. So that's where I'm at. But still think about as you're getting started, as you're doing, as you're actually taking action, think about what the mission is and then write it down. So they're, they're kind of contradicting, but at the same time, they can work together. Um, I really do believe, though, one of the biggest 
hindrances to success is just that you want it to be perfect before you even get started. And so you have to just get started and take action. Uh, but at the same time, if you just get started and don't have a mission or a vision, you might not know where you're going. So you've got to work on that. All right, so that was step one. We're going to go through four more steps. That's the smallest step, so next time it'll be a little bit bigger. Um, thank you. Hopefully, this is the book, if you're watching on the YouTube version, The Third Door by Alex Benayan. Hopefully, I've sold you on it a little bit. We'll talk more about it next time. And thank you for tuning in.